اهلا وسهلا يا جماعه اهلا بكم welcome everyone uh, welcome to tonight's workers world party webinar tonight our focus is palestine no normalization with colonization or occupation uh, my name is ted kelly i am from the philadelphia branch of workers world party and i am an editor of tear down the walls the prisoners solidarity committee page of Week workers world's weekly newspaper uh, tonight is Workers' World's contribution to the call for events and solidarity with Palestine from September 18th to 26th. The view of Workers' World Party from its founding has always been mina nahar el al bahar, from the river to the sea. We are for the right of Palestinian people to return, for the right of all Palestinians to return to all of Palestine. We fully support reparations, we support return, we demand an end to all US aid to the so-called state of Israel, which is a racist European white supremacist settler state from its founding until now. There are so many dates in September uh, that were intended as setbacks to the Palestinian struggle. Uh, 50 years ago, the massacres of Palestinians in Jordan by the US backed monarchy we remember the horrendous Israeli and Lebanese Falangist fascist massacres at the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila in Lebanon. We recall the fraud of the Oslo Accords and Trump's quote unquote deal of the century and this latest peace initiative by the tiny indebted and dependent on the US royal families of Bahrain and United Arab Emirates is just the latest of these diplomatic frauds. But what is so important is that the Palestinian struggle returns and revives. Uh, Workers World has always attempted to build solidarity with the Palestinian struggle in the streets through continuous and countless demonstrations in books, in our weekly newspaper, in our union and community work. Um, and I, you know, I'd just like to say also that the Palestinian struggle has always been internationalist and has lent solidarity and material support to the black liberation struggles in South Africa and the United States, to the anti-colonial revolutionary fighters in Northern Ireland. They've worked alongside Japanese communist militants. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And the international struggle against imperialism and white supremacy owes a huge debt of gratitude to the Palestinian liberation movement. And we hope to continue to foster that international solidarity tonight. Um, but it is also my huge honor to introduce tonight's co-chair, Charlotte Cates. Um, many Workers' World comrades uh, will remember Charlotte's years of work for Palestine in the New York and New Jersey area. Um, Charlotte is the international coordinator of Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network and organizer with the U.S. Campaign for Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel and Al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition. Um, Charlotte, thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thank you so much, Ted, and thank you so much to Workers World Party for hosting this important event today and for hosting this discussion at a critical time for the Palestinian liberation struggle and at a critical time for the Palestinian and Arab and international struggles for liberation. Um, as you mentioned, this uh, event is taking place as part of the Action for Return, uh, a week of events and organizing um, that was actually launched yesterday by the children and youth of Shatila Camp in Lebanon, who went to the memorial for those massacred at Sabra and Shatila to carry banners and signs and lay wreaths on the graves of the martyrs and say, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. We remain steadfast and we will return. And so uh, those children and youth in the camp of Shatila who continue to live generation after generation in the struggle for the total liberation of Palestine and the struggle for return, uh, inspire all of us around the world to continue to organize, to mobilize, to confront normalization, and to continue to build the liberation struggle. Um, as you noted, these days in September, 
uh, are harsh days of memory for the Palestinian cause and witness to horrendous crimes of imperialism, Zionism, and Arab reactionary regimes. And so this is one reason why it is so critical to use these days as days of struggle to affirm the adherence of the Palestinian people to their national, human, political, economic, and cultural rights, the right to return home, to reclaim stolen land and property, and complete the comprehensive liberation of Palestine. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have given their lives and have been jailed within Israeli occupation prisons for the struggle for return and liberation for a democratic Palestine on the entire land of Palestine. There are so many discussions today about where is Palestinian unity and where is Palestinian leadership, but we know that there is in fact a true and trusted leadership of the Palestinian people at the heart of resistance who continue to stand within the behind prison bars, within the prisons, confronting all attempts at liquidation and struggling with their bodies and lives on the line every single day against Zionist colonialism. The struggle and leadership of the Palestinian prisoners, it was what guides us at Samidun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network um, to mobilize on an international level as well as on an Arab level and with our Palestinian comrades to build greater solidarity, support, and unity behind the struggle of the Palestinian people for the liberation of the Palestinian prisoners and the liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. And we invite everybody who is watching this webinar and who's participating today to join us in these international days of action to build up our collective struggle, to make it clear that normalization will not pass, that US imperialism's crimes will not be accepted, and that we will continue to build, organize, and mobilize for the future to come. So with that being said, I'm very honored to introduce the first of the main speakers on today's program. Susan Abulhawa is a Palestinian novelist, a poet, a longtime activist, a member of the Workers' World Party, the Campaign to Free Mumia Abu Jamal, and also a colleague of mine at the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Susan was founder of a non-governmental organization, Playgrounds for Palestine, and is the author of several powerful novels that capture different aspects of the Palestinian experience in historic Palestine and as refugees in diaspora and exile. Mornings in Janine, The Blue Between Sky and Water, and her just released uh, brand new novel, bringing in acclaim um, from writers uh, and reviewers around the world against the loveless world. As a prominent author, Susan was invited to attend the Kalimat Literature Festival in Palestine, but was banned and barred from attending her homeland by Israeli occupation forces. Susan, could you talk about the so-called normalization of relations between certain Gulf states and Israel? Hi, Charlotte, um, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to be to be here with uh, with my comrades from Workers World and um, and US Um You know, it is. I mean, I won't lie. It's uh, it has been um, a bit heartbreaking, um, but it's also. It, it hasn't been unexpected. You know, we, we've known for years that the UAE um, and Saudi Arabia uh, and other Gulf nations had, uh, had cooperation kind of behind closed doors with Israel. It was kind of an open secret. Um, and over the past couple of years, there have been, um, campaigns, uh, sort of subversive campaigns to try and prepare, I guess, the Arab public for, for this moment. For example, um, every year during Ramadan, there, there's, uh, you know, there's the Ramadan series. It's basically a, the Ramadan soap opera um, that people just wait for during Ramadan. And it's kind of captures people's attention all over the Arab world. So you have millions, uh, you know, about 300 million people sitting down um, after breaking the fast to watch the Ramadan series. Um, it's wildly popular. And this year, um, there was a series called Um Harun, which basically was, um, there was a lot of stuff in there uh, that 
um, hinted at or promoted reproachment with Israel and also kind of denigrated Palestinians in a lot of ways. Um, for example, they were kind of pushing this, um, you know, propaganda myth that Palestinians, that we sold our country and whatnot, or we ran like cowards and just, you know, things like that, that th this is the kind of stuff that was being, is, you know, was being pushed in popular media in the Arab world by state actors who, you know, control the media to, to a large extent. So there was all this activity um, in preparation for it. So we kind of um, you know, a lot of us who were kind of watching this on the sidelines understood that this, this moment was going to arrive. Um, it didn't make it any less, um, any less painful. Um, but the, you know, in some ways it's good for things to be out in the open like this. Um, because, you know, this, um, this normalization agreement is really going to polarize the Middle East um, to a large extent, I believe, in ways that um, that we haven't really seen before. Um, there's also, you know, um, there's also this this other element of, you know, Arab like why are Arab nations doing this? Um, there is, of course, you know, some economic benefit, and that's kind of what you know is uh, some people are are, are pushing. Um, they're also the UAE has been trying to say that oh, we're helping the Palestinians, which of course was immediately Netanyahu immediately you know sort of showed that to be a lie because um, the the first propaganda. Um, sound bite was, oh, this will take annexation off the table. Um, you know, prior to that, Israel was just about to annex the Jordan Valley, um, which is another thing that's just kind of a matter of time. And um, immediately, literally, like, I think it was that day or the next day, Netanyahu said, no, annexation is not off the table. Um, it's just, you know, we just, it's, we put it on a temporary hold. So right away, I mean, you know, these new these new friends. I mean, right away, uh, uh, Israel just kind of you know stabbed them in the back, right? <laughs> um, and the and then and then it, and then same thing happened just a few days later. Um, so ostensibly, uh, a weapons contract for F thirty five military jets was part of this UAE deal with Israel, um, but. Uh, right away, Israel blocked the sale, um, which they have the power to do in the US. It's remarkable. I mean, you, Israel basically controls US foreign policy. Literally, even though this was part of part of a deal, you know, supposedly brokered by the US, um, and the UAE was supposed to get F-35 jets out of the out of the deal, but Israel turned around and blocked that. Um, and but the UAE can, you know went along with it um, anyway. There were there were reports that they were hugely dismayed, but they they didn't do anything about it. Um, and I think honestly, like there's this is the honeymoon period right now, but I think there's going to be more of that um, to come. Um, Israel has no friends. Israel cannot be trusted. Um, you know the United States, which is supposed to be its closest ally. I mean, just last year. Um, you know, the, they, uh, these so-called Stingray um, cell phone spy equipment was, had been planted by Israeli agents around the White House to, inter to intercept um, White House uh, cell phone calls. And everybody knew it. And, you know, nothing, <laughs> um, nothing happened to Israel. And, and likewise, you know, during the Obama ad administration, I mean, it was um, the way that Netanyahu came here to literally undermine the foreign policy of a sitting president on US soil when he addressed um, a joint session of Congress and then went on um, all these US um, news talk shows to, uh, um, to, to, to poo poo the Iran deal and basically undermine President Obama. So, um, you know, that's what Israel does to the United States. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of time before 
um, uh, I think things come to a head with the UAE because um, whatever deals, whatever business deals, whatever military deals come of this new uh, normalization agreement um, is going to be for the benefit of Israel. And it's going to, it's, it's never a two way street with Israel. Things run one way and Israel is very good at entangling people in their own laws. And I think this is what's gonna happen in the UAE. I think it's a matter of time before um, number one, Israeli, uh, Israeli society is going to freak out if they see a lot of a lot more Arabs coming to Jerusalem to pray at Al-Aqsa, especially if they're arriving in Arab um, in traditional Arab dress, um, because frankly their their racism is medieval, and uh, and and so so that I predict that's going to be you know that's going to be an issue. Um, they and, and likewise, I think whatever business deals happen um, is going to end up being a siphoning of um, of resources toward Israel because that's just what they do. Um, as far as Palestinians are concerned, I mean, I talked. I've been talking a lot about you know this, um, you know what what it means for for these new these newlyweds um, after their honeymoon. I think it's going to end in divorce, frankly. Um, but, you know, we, it, it's definitely a dark time for us, but, but it's also, but it's also replete with, um, with hope and inspiration and, and ideas of a new generation and this growing international solidarity. I do believe ultimately that the, the, the kind of internationalism that is occurring, um, uh, uh among, struggles all over the world like-minded struggles for for justice for for social for, for for social justice for climate justice um a, a, for economic justice political justice um you know israel can, israel has no standing in this arena and i believe that this this arena um is what occupies the minds of and the passions of the masses um, and I do, I do believe that we will prevail no matter how, how dark it looks for us. Um, you know, history has shown us time and time again, that how, how quickly the powerful can fall, um, the swiftness of it, uh, of, of, people and regimes that we think are indestructible um, and, uh, uh, and immensely powerful have crumbled numerous times overnight. Um, and, you know, and in our lifetime, it's happened in the Middle East. I mean, we've watched that happen um, in several countries. So um, I, I am not despairing. Um, and, uh, um, and I, but I, I do, I am counting on, on the kind of solidarity that we, we can foster um, among the masses by educating people, pushing for, um, pushing for, for socialism, pushing for anti-colonial ideals, pushing for justice, um, and, and on, on, because on the international arena, the question of Palestine is at the heart of every social justice movement because if we fall, other people will fall. Like Palestine is the test in my mind um, of, of what we, uh, it, it's the test of, of how, uh, how we can succeed and how we can push forward. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've talked a lot, but um, I'll just stop here. I know there are others wanting to speak. There are other, um, a lot of other things I, I would love to get into, but I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it um, for later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susie, for that great um, introduction. Um, and uh, I encourage everybody who is listening to make sure that you are um, typing your questions into the Q&A. We're gonna have a Q&A period at the end where everyone can ask questions. We'll all be on camera together. Um, but for now, I would love to introduce our next speaker, um, 
Khalid Berakat is a Palestinian writer and activist whose work in Arabic and English has been widely published in a number of outlets. Um, Khalid is known for his ability to put the Palestinian struggle in an international working class perspective. Uh, Khalid is the international coordinator of the campaign to free Ahmed Sadat. Uh, Ahmed Sadat is held by Israel as a political prisoner, uh, the Secretary General of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a Marxist Palestinian organization, and an elected member of the Palestinian Legislative Council. In the past year, Khalid was barred from entering Germany for four years due to his Palestinian advocacy. German officials claimed Khalid, quote, constitutes a security risk, unquote, because, quote, his beliefs in continuous talking about liberating Palestine from the river to the sea and insisting that Israel has no right to exist, something that I don't think anyone on this panel would quarrel with. Uh, Khalid, thank you so much for being with us, and um, I would love to, to hear your remarks now. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Ted, and uh, thank you, uh, comrades in workers' world. Uh, please... Uh, allow me to just uh, salute the struggle of people in the United States, particularly the Black Liberation Movement and uh, uh, your struggle in, in the uh, belly of the beast is, uh, uh, you know how important it is for not just your struggle and not just for Palestine, but for the entire uh, world. And so, uh, I salute you all and thank you again for uh, inviting me. I just uh, wanted to begin by uh, saying that there has been a lot of, uh, let's say, exaggeration in terms of uh, this Emirati Bahraini Israel deal, in terms of how significant it is in uh, the scheme of, uh, you know, the, the strategy uh, in the region and the Palestinian struggle, because uh, this is not Camp David Accords. This is not Wadi Araba Accords between Jordan and Israel. This is not Oslo Agreement. We know uh, that the relationship between these two countries, particularly United Arab Emirates and Israel, has been um, really a, a speed up uh, uh, since 2012. Um, and just to look at one Israeli study that was published in 2013 uh, in the magazine uh, Ma'arachot, uh, and it's, it's a military uh, magazine, uh, uh, two uh, leading uh, Israeli strategists wrote uh, um, an article, a study, uh, talking about how the Red Sea uh, and the uh, Africa uh, and other places, the Persian Gulf particularly, has become in the center of the Israeli strategy and why it is, uh, is it important to strengthening the relationship with countries like uh, United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain. And we've began to see things like exchange of delegations in sports and trade and um, art and, and so on and so forth. And so no one is surprised because uh, our understanding, at least the view that I represent, is that Palestinian people have a camp of enemy and that it's imperialism, uh, Israel, and the reactionary Arab regimes. This is the triangle of, of death, the triangle of destruction. And so we're not surprised. Uh, the reason now the relationship is becoming more public is because of the new strategies that is being implemented, particularly by the United States and Israel, because most Arab reactionary regimes are just puppets and tools for uh, the US. Israel is kind of a, a mini partner for the, for, uh, for the US. So, they are crucial in this uh, strategy. Uh, not so many people know, for example, that today Israel have military presence in Eritrea. I mean, I'm talking about military bases. Uh, 
run by Israel in Ethiopia, in Kenya, uh, the islands of Halib and Fatima and Santian and Demidra, there are military presence, Israeli military presence, including the island of Sukatra, which is uh, right across uh, from the Yemenese ports. This was occupied by United Arab Emirates, uh, you know, in their uh, war against the people of Yemen. And now there are Israeli military presence. We also saw how the Saudi Arabia bought two strategic islands, uh, Tehran and Sanafir from the fascist regime of Egypt led by General Sisi. And so all of these things are not just symbolic normalization. This is not normalization. This is building a strong alliance between this uh, camp, US, Israel, and Arab reactionary regime uh, to confront uh, other strategies in the area, particularly to confront China and uh, Iran, uh, and not Turkey, like some people uh, believe. Um, uh, Turkey is uh, still have a very good relationship with Israel. They are uh, having these trades uh, with Israel. Didn't uh, it did not it was not affected. Uh, so it, these strategies are not confronting uh, Turkey. These strategies are absolutely confronting the camp of resistance in the region, particularly Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, the Palestinian resistance, the Yemenis resistance, uh, the Iraqi uh, today, and, uh, and so on and so forth. The other thing we need to remember is that this, these deals uh, does not represent the popular position in Bahrain and in the United Arab Emirates. Polls after polls shows that the vast majority of people of Bahrain reject normalization. The vast majority of people of uh, United Arab Emirates reject uh, normalization. So these positions are uh, representing the ruling class uh, of uh, these countries, and it does not represent the people of these countries. And it's important to realize uh, this, not just because um, there is an anti-normalization movement uh, and uh, pro-resistance movement, and in, in particularly in Bahrain, but also because, as uh, comrade Susan Abelhawa said, that eventually the situation will change and we will see shifts uh, of uh, in the balance of power uh, because there is a conflict, an internal conflict that has nothing to do directly with the situation in, in, in Palestine. I mean, this is, uh, this is there. Uh, whether Palestinians fight or not, the people of Lebanon are fighting and there are a very strong resistance in Lebanon. Whether, you know, uh, uh, today when we look at the, um, at our situation is not exactly uh, very, uh, you know, uh, negative, I mean, uh, we have a very strong resistance camps in the area, uh, in Lebanon, in, in Palestine, uh, in Syria, and Iran, and Iraq, and it's it's really important. And that is beside the popular resistance. In fact, one of the reasons that they are bringing this to public uh, and to uh, forming this alliance, uh, you know, publicly, is because they have lost uh, miserably. Uh, in their strategies. Yes, they destroyed Syria, but uh, uh, they couldn't uh, bring Syria to its knees and uh, they have destroyed Iraq, but uh, Iraq is still uh, uh, part of, of a camp that is rejecting occupation and still supporting the Palestinian cause. Uh, yes, they were able to uh, push the Palestinian capitalist uh, a class represented by Mahmoud Abbas and his crannies uh, into uh, submission and they became tools for the Israeli occupiers, but they couldn't do that to Palestinians. We have a very strong resistance today in Gaza and uh, we 
are not exaggerating when we say that Palestinian resistance in Gaza today is, is, is crucial and important. Uh, Israel is not, uh, it cannot do whatever it wishes to do. Israel knows that Palestinians, despite their you know, conditions and uh, the siege, despite all the um, atrocities being uh, carried against them, uh, despite all of that, Palestinians are uh, still uh, resisting. And that is another fact that we always need to, uh, I think, remember. Uh, when we look at the, a little bit of history of the region, we see that the same exact thing happened in the region in the 50s and 60s. We all remember the alliance of Baghdad, how some Arab regimes uh, uh, publicly aligned themselves with the British. We saw what happened in the 60s during the Nasser, Nasser time of Egypt when the Egyptians were helping the Yemenis and the role of the reactionary regime in Saudi Arabia. It was very, pretty much uh, almost identical to today's uh, situation. So th this, is, th this is a conflict. Uh, that is intensifying uh, from the international balance of power. Uh, we see a retreat in the United States hegemony and control over the world. We see a rise of uh, international forces and powers. On regional level, we also see that, uh, you know, these uh, regimes like, uh, you know, in, in Egypt and, and Jordan and, and the Gulf is, is forming uh, this alliance because they feel threatened, uh, especially after 2011 and the what happened in the Arab world. Uh, and if I can just say a few words about that, because uh, often, uh, you know, some people talked about talks about what happened in 2011 and the Arab, uh, what they call the Arab Spring or Arab revolts is that it was uh, some kind of conspiracy. Uh, it, it wasn't. Uh, people truly revolted against these Arab regimes. And later on, uh, their movement were uh, hijacked by reactionary forces and it became, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, benefiting the, the, the strategies of the U.S. and Israel and Arab reaction regimes. But if you go back to Israel position in 2011, 2012, Israel was in really deep crisis looking at how the, the, the Arab people have revolted against uh, their regimes. So uh, in one hand, we have to distinguish between the legitimacy of people uh, revolting, and uh, uh, on the other hand, we have to see how their revolts have been directed in the wrong uh, direction. Because, uh, you know, it's the, the, the issue is not just to fight, but to know who you fight and where you fight uh, and for what purposes and, and reasons. And I think this lesson has been learned uh, today more and more in, in the region by the people of, uh, you know, the region, the, the uh, they realize that uh, uh, that's why you, you see so much talks of the 60s these days, going back to defining, uh, you know, the, the camps of the enemy and how Palestinian revolution uh, needs to, um, you know, be looked at again uh, as the only path for Palestinians to uh, liberate Palestine and to for refugees to return to, to their homes. And so, the reason that the people and the masses are, are looking at these facts is because um, they're paying the, the, the prices, uh, they're paying a very heavy price of uh, the destruction that took place in the last 10, uh, 11 years. Uh, the question is, could United Arab Emirates and Bahrain have entered this deal without uh, the Oslo agreement and the position of the Palestinian Authority? And that is important to look at the Palestinian internal question. There are a Palestinian authority that is administrating the interest of the 1% of Palestinian capitalists. Uh, these are uh, traitors and uh, Palestinians who 
uh, choose to be with the occupiers, uh, stabbing their people in the back, signing deals with Israel without any uh, consent or approval from Palestinian national institutions, including the institution they rule. Uh, they didn't even bother to, to get that. So uh, today, the camps in, in Palestine is also uh, being more and more clear. Uh, and in the last 30 years, uh, you know, leftists are being sh shy away from offering class analysis to, to, uh, to issues. Uh, you know, maybe we used to do it too much in, in the past, but uh, lately uh, there are no real uh, analysis uh, that it's uh, based on, you know, class analysis. And, and today we need that. Uh, we need that uh, in order to explain uh, to ourselves and to people uh, where, uh, where is the real issues and, and the real uh, problems of, of our region. Um, I just, I will end uh, just by saying that it is uh, really important to look at the situation today, not just as a crisis of Palestinians, but uh, it provides maybe an opportunity for our people to uh, seize and to march forward uh, to say that all of these schemes from the Madrid conference of 91 to the Oslo agreement of 93 to the Camp David and Wadi Araba, including the latest agreements, uh, will not uh, be able to divert uh, Palestinian uh, focus on uh, the real issues, and that is the liberation uh, of Palestine, the entire land uh, of Palestine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khaled. Um, before we go to the Q&A for tonight's two guests, I'd like to um, give you some more information about Samidun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network and how you can get involved. Um, as we noted earlier, Sami Dune is an international Arab and Palestinian network of organizers and activists that works to build solidarity with the Palestinian struggle and specifically focuses on the struggle of Palestinian prisoners um, behind bars in Israeli jails for several reasons. One being that the cause and struggle of the prisoners is central to the liberation of Palestine, just like the liberation of freedom fighters and political prisoners is central to all liberation struggles around the world. And just as it's central in the United States, um, it's also central in the Palestinian movement. And that to support the Palestinian prisoners is to reject the path of Oslo, Madrid, negotiations, compromise, and settlement, um, and, co and conciliation with imperialism, and instead support the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian people who are on the front lines um, with their bodies and lives on a daily basis, fighting Zionism, imperialism, colonialism, and racism. And um, furthermore, that supporting the Palestinian prisoners means supporting Palestinian resistance, supporting the right of Palestinian resistance by all means, including community organizing and including armed struggle, including organizing on campuses to have book fairs and student movements, um, just as much as that means uh, taking up arms and being part of the resistance in Gaza because the Palestinian prisoners movement reflects all of these forms of resistance because they are all targeted by the Israeli occupation for repression. And furthermore, um, supporting the prisoners is an internationalist movement because it's not just about supporting the liberation of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. It's also talking about the liberation of Palestinian prisoners in U.S. jails, in British jails. It's talking about the fight to free George Abdullah um, from French prisons. But of course, um, you know, if we know that the Palestinian struggle, as both um, Khaled and Susan said so well, is an internationalist struggle for liberation, then when we look at this, the struggle of the prisoners, we know that we're not just fighting for the freedom of Palestinian prisoners, but for the prisoners of all liberation struggles of the Black Liberation Movement, um, of the Puerto Rican Movement, um, of indigenous 
of self-determination and sovereignty organizers who are targeted, and of fighters against, um, of, against all forms of imperialism and colonialism, from the political prisoners in Turkey to those in the Philippines, um, to those who continue to fight back and organize um, around the world and struggle for liberation. So we wanna invite um, everyone to get involved with Sami Dune. We have chapters and affiliates in a number of countries, including the United States, Canada, Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Greece, and occupied Palestine. And we always welcome new members, new activists, and new relationships where we build together collectively with all of our organizations in one collective struggle for the liberation of the prisoners, for the liberation of the people, and for a liberated world and society. So thank you for allowing me to share some information about Sami Dune. I'll put the link to our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and our Instagram in the chat. And I want to encourage people who are interested in building the struggle together and being part of the days of action and organizing for liberation for the prisoners to contact us so that we can continue to organize and struggle together. So I'd like to turn it over to Ted. Thank you, Charlotte. And, you know, just speaking on behalf of the Prisoners Solidarity Committee of Workers World Party, I hope that this is uh, tonight is the beginning of a longstanding coordination, a beautiful friendship, you might say, between the PSC and Sami Dun. Um, the, the political prisoners we need to free include George Abdullah, Khalida Jarar, Ahmed Sadat, Mumia Abu Jamal, Imam Jamil Alamin, Ana Belen Montes, uh, Red Fawn, Rattler, and the other standing, standing rock water protectors. And I'm just so glad that you mentioned so many of those names. Um, Right now, um, I would like to encourage everyone, you can link up with Workers World Party and sign up for our daily news service by visiting www.workers.org and you can subscribe to our email list um, where you can, you know, Workers World for, for decades has published a uh, weekly uh, newspaper. All of our articles are up online and you can get a sort of digest of these news articles um, delivered straight to your inbox. And if you like what you're hearing tonight and you're interested in learning more, you can join Workers World Party. Um, we are a Marxist-Leninist uh, political organization. Um, we believe in tackling and destroying, dismantling the pillars of white supremacy, imperialism, and overthrowing this capitalist regime so that we can you know, move forward um, globally into a, a, a true workers world. Um, but now I would like to invite all our panelists to come back on camera so that we can enter our Q and a portion, um, for the last sort of, uh, 45 minutes or so of our, of our program tonight. Um, and it looks like we have a lot of questions coming in, which is very exciting. Um, and, you know, I think, but maybe to start something that, that everyone can address is, um, you know, could we talk a little bit about the spread of COVID-19 in occupied Palestine and what, what it means to have access to medical care um, while living under foreign occupation? And this could be for Susan or Khaled. Um, uh, I mean, I can speak very briefly and, and Khaled can um, hopefully maybe add to it. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because um, Israel destroyed at least three testing centers um, that were set up um, by Palestinians. They literally just came and demolished them. So already, you know, the the Palestinian healthcare sector has been um, stretched thin, especially in Gaza, by you know the ongoing. Um, the, the siege, the uh, the uh, the restrictions on fuel and electricity coming in, the uh, persistent bombing and destruction of of infrastructure, including hospitals, um, and um, you know we we've been watching Gaza especially quite co closely, and um, the the authorities there actually had done a really good job, and they've done a good job so far of of containing things, 
um, because if if it kind of get if it gets loose, and there's some signs now that there are some um, uh, infections that are beyond the isolation zones, which is a bit scary, um, because it's you know it's literally the most densely populated spot on Earth, and there's um, Gazans have an average of six hours a day of electricity. There's no schedule when that comes on or off. Often it comes in the middle of the night, so people stay up late. So, so the lack of electricity, the lack of um, sufficient infrastructure, medical infrastructure, sanitation infrastructure has broken down. You know, compounding um, this this threat. I mean, the water in Gaza is undrinkable now. Um, and then, you know, the siege does not. Israel does not allow. Palestinians to leave even for for medical care and as a matter of fact one of the things Israel does um, very cynically is to um, you know uh, uh, try to coerce people who are in desperate need of medical attention outside of Gaza um, whether it's for you know a certain kind of surgery that's not available or cancer treatment or whatnot they coerce these families into becoming informants. Um, so, so, you know, that, that further, you know, to sabotage the resistance, but nonetheless, you know, the resistance, I mean, no matter what they have done to Gaza and how battered Gaza is, there's still a resistance in Gaza. I mean, Palestinians aren't going to give up. It's like, like Comrade Khaled said, it's um, our resistance. That, that is, that is something that Israel and the world can count on is that we're not gonna go away. We're not gonna go away whether we're inside Palestine, whether we're exiled outside of Palestine, whether we're in refugee camps, Palestine, we have a one track mind and it's to Palestine. Uh, that's certainly you know, my reality, that's what I live, that's what I have always lived. Um, I have a one track mind, I wanna go home. Um, and if I don't get to, I want my daughter to be able to go there. So, so that, that is a constant, um, I know that's, you know, off the topic of, of, of COVID, but it's not really because, um, and, and I don't want to sort of fetishize or romanticize Palestinian society because I don't really like that either. Um, we're humans complete with all kinds of, um, uh, uh, you know, um, problems and, and whatnot, but we do have mechanisms to take care of each other that have been developed over, you know, decades of occupation and, um, and that were honed during the height of uprisings where people literally just had to depend on each other to educate each other's children, to, to make sure everyone is fed um, and to just, to just show up for people. So those, so those kinds of social networks and infrastructure is in place to help us get through whatever we need to. And those of us on the outside, of course, we, you know, we, you know, our job here is to support the folks who, um, who are at home. We're lucky enough to be at home too. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, if I just, uh... <laughs> Couple of comments, you know, uh, when uh, COVID-19 and, and Palestinians are being discussed, usually the focus is on the West Bank and Gaza. And that is because uh, the international institutions and even the discourse, including some of the Palestinian discourse is, is, is limiting Palestinians to the West Bank and Gaza. In fact, when the epidemic started, there were so many popular jokes by our people in Gaza that we're lucky we're under siege, no COVID-19 will come near us. And these were uh, also, uh, you know, but now Gaza is uh, absolutely uh, facing uh, uh, greater challenges, especially in the last two months. Uh, there has been uh, uh, lots of efforts uh, by our people in Gaza to combat the COVID-19 under siege, I mean, under total siege. And so you can imagine where countries are failing in fighting this epidemic, uh, uh, how would, uh, you know, as people uh, uh, like our people in their conditions in Gaza would do so. But they are doing uh, 
their uh, their best. Uh, now, in in the refugee camps of Lebanon and uh, Syria, uh, you know, there has been um, um, people already uh, are suffering lack of uh, medical uh, services at the whether the, the Lebanese government or the UNRWA are uh, uh, complicit in this. Uh, and that's before the uh, COVID-19. So you can imagine how the situation now also uh, in, in, in Lebanon. The Palestinian Authority, when they count Palestinians who are being affected by this outside Palestine, they count the one from the West Bank and they do and they leave the, the rest of the Palestinian uh, not counted as if they are not uh, Palestinians or are they are not uh, important. And this is something that we need to look at. It's it's not just political. It is uh, it is uh, real and it, it's uh, it's connected very much to the health and the the well-being of our uh, of our people. Uh, just one last comment. Israel have released all those criminals, Israeli criminals, who are being in jail, saying that uh, they need to be sent home because of the epidemic. But they also say that we assure the Israeli public that no Palestinian prisoner will be released uh, due to uh, COVID-19. So, you know, uh, Charlotte uh, actually could uh, talk uh, more about this uh, when it comes to you know, prisoners and COVID-19. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, I, I think I would love to address this question to both Charlotte and Khalid and Susan. Um, both Khalid in, in leading campaigns for political prisoners and Susan in, in, in writing um, so graphically about brutal Israeli prison conditions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and Charlotte, this goes for you too. Can we talk about the conditions of Palestinian political prisoners and and maybe most importantly, how to get involved in solidarity work with them? I'll let Charlotte, you, you, I think that you're better. Um, I can go after you. Okay. Well, I, um, you know, of course, your most, uh, your most recent work uh, begins from with this, uh, with this perspective with a with a fictionalized version of this perspective yet based very much on um, on a reality, and I, I, I do want to note that there have been many uh, really excellent pieces of Palestinian art and literature and poetry and film that have developed from the prison experience, and this is um, partially because the prison experience has become both so symbolic of um, Palestinian existence um, under settler colonialism, not just the experience of Palestinians inside occupied Palestine, but also um, to the experience of Palestinian refugees and communities in diaspora, including the targeting and criminalization that has taken place around the world. Um, but also because many of the artists and writers of Palestine have been imprisoned and have spent time in prison and have given birth to um, you know, poetry and creativity that has continued to inspire Palestinians, Arabs, and internationals um, with the power of those words and that art and that cultural production that has stemmed from the experience of Israeli imprisonment. And this is partially because it is such a, a commonality within Palestinian society. I mean, if we look at, for example, in the West Bank, you know, 40% of Palestinian men have spent time in Israeli prisons. Um, and this is, this is a huge number. This means that um, you know, every, in everyone's family, there's a, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a cousin, an uncle, a son, a daughter, a nephew, a cousin who has spent time in Israeli prisons that every night there are Israeli army jeeps going out into the villages, the cities and the refugee camps, um, blowing down doors, invading homes and taking and, you know, grabbing people violently from their homes, ransacking their belongings, storming in with guns, including children, including child prisoners, child political prisoners, um, you know, as young as 12 are arrested in the middle of the night by Israeli occupation forces who break down doors and sometimes explode them off their hinges to storm inside and drag uh, children, adults and elders from their homes in the middle of the night and take them to interrogation centers and subject them to torture and abuse. Um, 
the entire system of imprisonment um, in the Israeli regime is a, is a colonial weapon and it's a colonial mechanism. And I, and I mean, this isn't that distinct in some ways from the way in which imprisonment is used as a colonial mechanism in other settler colonial countries like the United States, like Canada, um, the way it's been used by colonialist and imperialist forces around the world. Um, and something that's become so definitional of the Palestinian experience, which is why organizing in solidarity with the prisoners is so critical. I mean, we have seen some cases um, in just the past year of really um, extreme levels of torture applied to Palestinians under interrogation. When we look at cases like those of Sabra Abid, of Walid Nacha, um, people who have, you know, someone who was beaten so badly that he was in a coma and he was taken to the hospital and when he was taken to the hospital, he continued to be shackled to the bed. And while he was shackled to the bed in a coma in a hospital, an Israeli soldier let off a tear gas stun grenade. So the point that he developed an infection in his lungs and a kidney infection that he did not have before he was arrested because he was tortured so severely. Um, now there are, and so this is, this is the reality of what Israeli imprisonment and what Israeli interrogation looks like. It looks like torture. It looks like um, lengthy, lengthy sentences. We see children being sentenced for, you know, five, 10, 15 years, especially children from Jerusalem in an attempt to um, kind of, it's part of that attempt to wipe out Palestinian existence and resistance within, within Jerusalem um, and, and throughout. And we see, you know, attempts right now, like the attempt of uh, the Israeli occupation to strip Salah Hamouri, a uh, Palestinian former political prisoner, a lawyer, a human rights defender, of his very right to live in Palestine, of his right to live in Jerusalem, the city in which he was born, saying that he's um, violated restrictions on entering Israel because he does not show loyalty to the state when he was born a Palestinian in Jerusalem. And so, um, the struggle of Palestinian political prisoners, I think like that in every liberation struggle is so critical to um, the Palestinian struggle for freedom overall. Um, sometimes within the context of the Oslo process, you know, as, uh, as both Khaled and Susan have discussed these very critical issues, the right of return of Palestinian refugees, um, the right of Palestinian prisoners to be free, to be liberated, the right of Palestinians to self-determination and sovereignty in their land, are instead classified as files or final status issues or something to be negotiated later on. But in fact, they're at the heart and the core of the, of the Palestinian struggle. And we know that there are many organizations doing amazing work to support the prisoners. There are organizations inside Palestine providing legal support and family support to the prisoners. There are international solidarity and advocacy organizations that are working to raise these issues. Um, you know, whether through the legal level, whether, you know, in the United Nations or, I mean, for us, what's most important is that organizing on the ground in communities and with other movements that are also targeted by the same forms, by the same types of repression. And so, um, you know, I want to encourage, you know, every organization that's working on Palestine to include the prisoners in that work that's being done. And that, you know, us at Sami Dune, we want to work with everybody to kind of make this movement as collective and broad and strong as possible. Because there are, you know, 5,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. Almost 400 of them are held in administrative detention without charge or trial. Those who aren't have been forced into the military court system um, where over 99% of Palestinians are convicted. Um, Palestinians are subjected to torture routinely. There are so many stories that I could tell from those of the leaders like Ahmed Sadat and Marwan Barouti and Khaled Ajrar to those of the over 300 Palestinian high school and university students who are currently being imprisoned because they organize in their campuses and, and hold events like book fairs and lectures um, or participate in student elections on their campuses. And so, um, I want to invite everyone to get involved, work together, and build our movement to become a, as strong and powerful as it can possibly be. And just finally, I know I'm going on, uh, that this is part of the boycott of Israel. So when we're talking about boycotting Israel, it's, you know, it's 
for all of these reasons. It's not just about the occupation. It's not just about the wall. Um, it's about apartheid, but it's about that comprehensive apartheid settler colonialism, um, racist imperial project of the Israeli state. And so that includes boycotting Israel, its academic and cultural institutions, and also the corporations like G4S and HP that are literally profiting from the imprisonment of Palestinians and the targeting of Palestinian lives. Thanks, Charlotte. And Susan, did you wanna uh, respond to that question as well? Yeah, um, I wanted to just expand on um, uh, what Charlotte said um, regarding, um, well, starting, for example, with, you know, the, um, I was struck by your comment about the, the children in Jerusalem being arrested. As a matter of fact, um, this is a policy of Israel. Um, and a lot of soldiers articulate it. And the purpose is to basically terrorize them young because they want, um, they, they, they want them, they want Palestinians to, to live in fear of Israeli soldiers. And that's how they control the population by, by terrorizing the children and making sure they get them young. I mean, soldiers will, will tell you this. And so um, the, 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 the harassment and terrorizing of children very young children. I know the, you know, often they'll say, oh, as young as 12, but actually much younger. Um, and there's plenty of, of video and photographic evidence of, of this. Um, so that, that is, that is very, that's quite routine. And, and this sort of mass incarceration of, of Palestinians, um, is I think another point, um, of intersection with the black liberation struggle in the United States. I think anywhere there is a, a colonial um, oppress oppressive system, there is, there is a legal network that is meant to ensnare um, and, and just warehouse bodies um, as a method of control and also profit. Um, and so, uh, you know, we see that both among Palestinians and, and among um, Black America. And um, one of, and the other point Charlotte made regarding, you know, a lot of literature coming out of, of prisons, um, we are uh, organizing the Palestine Rights Literature Festival. And one of the panels that we're going to have is about prison writing. And, and the premise is this, because I think, you know, if you, if, if you talk to sort of white America, um, the idea of prison is that's where bad people go. But when you come from a community of struggle or an oppressed community, the prison is where our leaders are. It's where the, the, the truly free members of our society are. Um, you know, the three, the three leaders that Charlotte mentioned, um, Marwan Barghouti, Ahmed Saadat, and Khalid Jarrar, um, you know, all three of them are revolutionaries and, and uh, they are the contemporaries and um, of, of Mumia Abu, Abu Jamal and, um, uh, and, and so many others. And, you know, we regard all of these people as being among the freest people, you know, that we know. Um, so prison is central to our society, um, and it is it is it is a point of resistance, of of inspiration, of literature, of culture, of um, of of critical thought. So um, that's you know that's a parallel again with um, with with the Black liberation struggle. Uh, and another layer of, uh, of the solidarity that exists between, um, between our two societies. Um, I also wanted to um, talk about, to expand also on, on something Charlotte talked about, you know, pertaining to the totality of uh, Israel's colonization of Palestine. And again, these aren't just the these aren't just the you know the 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 things that are happening. It's not just the occupation. It's not just the mass incarceration. Israel's colonization of Palestine has so many tentacles that extend in every direction. 
So like, for example, the, there's this quiet um, catastrophe that's happening that nobody really talks about. And it, it, it is this sort of systematic destruction of Palestinian um, archeological sites. So anything that has nothing to do with um, Jewish history, and there's, you know, there's literally millennia of non-Jewish sort of habitation, you know, um, and so there's lots of these, there's lots of these sites, lots of these ancient villages and cities that Israel is literally destroying and building over to wipe out traces of us. Um, I kind of relate that to the, the, the way that, um, uh, Mount Rushmore was carved out of the Black Hills, right? These were sacred Black Hills to indigenous Americans. And, and they, they obliterated it and put their faces on it. You know, this is what Israel is doing to Palestine. They are destroying our olive trees. They are destroying our archeological sites and they, are, and they are putting something new there. They are appropriating our culture they, um, in this sort of, you know, this very elaborate theater of, of indigeneity. These people who came from Europe um, suddenly are, 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 are claiming falafel as their indigenous food and hummus and shakshuka. And now they're, they're, they're doing a dapke and they're, they're claiming tatris as, you know, as their, as their clothes. Um, they have even like a blue and white kafiya. I mean, if it weren't so dangerous, it would be laughable. I mean, these, these people who have like, they have no culture of their own. There's no unifying culture. But so, so in an effort, you know, uh, part of their colonization is also this, this parasitic sort of indigenizing themselves. It's like, it's, it's a body snatching campaign in a way. Um, that's part of this whole uh, uh, colonial enterprise, which hasn't really, which is, which is relatively a new concept really in, uh, in colonialism, right? Colonizers typically go to a place and they take over because they think they're better and they wipe out you know, indigenous traditions and whatnot. Israel uh, came with this myth that they're actually returning. Um, and so, so they are now attempting to indigenize themselves. They don't have a culture of their own. They don't have their own food. They don't have their own music, their own clothes, their, nothing. Nothing that is in, that is indigenous to that land. So they're so they're stealing Palestinian identity, um, which is unlike the you know the traditional um, colonization projects that we've known in history. So um, I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> Excellent points all around. Um, we have we have so many good questions coming in. I almost hate to jump in and direct the conversation, but. This one I think is an important one to, to bring up. Um, and it's regarding that in, in the US, Palestinian scholars and educators have come under attack for daring to teach the kind of things that Susie is, is talking about right now and the role of the US um, and Israel as a European settler colonialist project. Um, and right now at um, San Francisco State, um, there was a webinar organized for September 23rd featuring Leila Khalid, and it's under attack right now by the ultra right. And I, I'm wondering if the panelists could talk about why this is happening and how we can fight back against these attacks. Uh, I think Susan can <laughs> answer this question. I'll, I'll say maybe a few sentences later. Um. So the so yeah you're right about um, U.S. scholars uh, sort of being targeted. Um, actually, there was just a story. Um, I think it was UNC um, North Carolina. I'm not sure, but there was a there was a search for director. Um, what was it? Anyway, I can't I can't remember who it was, but she. Um, she was chosen by this huge search, by this committee, search committee that interviewed a wide range of candidates. It just happened last week and I'm, I'm having a, a brain blank, 
but um but basically so so she was chosen and then this you know mega donor to the university stepped in and said you know we don't like her politics vis-a-vis -vis palestine and so the the entire search was called off and uh the the offer was rescinded and of course you know the very famous case of stephen salaita um, you know, Zionists hounded him. They hounded him. They made him lose. I mean, he he lost his job. He lost his house. Um, and even after that, they still weren't done with him. They followed him to Beirut, where he had, you know, where where he where he worked. And um, uh, and and even there, they 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 just did not stop until. Uh, I mean, they wanted to destroy his life, but of course, you know, he um, uh, he was far more resilient than them, and 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 I and I believe that Stephen triumphed, and he will continue to triumph. Um, but but yeah, and a lot of scholars, like I have a lot of friends who are professors and who weren't tenured, and they're afraid to say things and do things because their livelihood is on the line. And I think it's generally understood in the academy that. Um, this is the one thing that, you know, uh, the one kind of speech that's not free speech, right? Like you can be a Nazi, you can, you know, you can, uh, um, you can say or do anything. You can be a white supremacist and, and it all files under free speech. But if you, if you um, support BDS, the boycott campaign, you that's way out of bounds right you you lose your job you're anti-semitic and um and all that so but i just and and you know the, the other part of your question is how do we combat that uh, i think really having courage <laughs> you know um it's hard and i think we whenever these things happen i think it's up to all of us really to support the person going through this um you know, I uh, we can't leave people to flounder on their own. People who stand up for uh, for the rights of others and suddenly find themselves in a position um, where their their livelihood is compromised or in jeopardy. I think it's it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that they are supported and um, uh, and and backed up. Thanks, Susie. Khaled. I mean, the goal is uh, very clear, is to silence Palestinians and to oppress Palestinian voices, regardless uh, of uh, where they come from, whether they are, uh, whether it's a Palestinian, uh, you know, writer or a Palestinian, uh, um, you know, struggler or a student. And we have thousands and thousands of cases uh, that we can uh, that we can uh, give, but I want to give two or three examples, quick examples. One is that why did Israel, for example, kill the Palestinian writer and novelist Ghassan Kenafani? Ghassan Kenafani did not uh, was not part of uh, you know the military resistance for say he did not. Uh, uh, go and uh, uh, you know um, hijacked an airplane like Layla did and, and we're very proud of her for doing that uh, and, but they killed Ghassan Kanafani for being uh, a spokesperson of the Palestinian resistance for being a novelist and an artist and for representing Palestinian struggle uh, if we go back to the 80s, they killed Alex Oda, they harassed Edward Said, uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, they waged campaigns against scholars like Iqbal Ahmed and, uh, you know, uh, others. And so this is not new for uh, uh, Palestinians, but what is really important uh, to uh, do is, as uh, Suzanne said, is uh, there is no other answers but to have courage and to uh, also uh, not just express ourselves as Palestinians, uh, but also to 
encourage others to express themselves because the role of Palestinians is not just to liberate themselves, but also to liberate others. And this is a, a responsibility and a, and a duty. And so um, I don't think that this campaign is going to uh, silence Leila Khalid or uh, the organizers uh, for that matter of this. It's only going to make them stronger that their voice is bothering the Zionist movement and that's good. This is good. Thank you. Great points to both of you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions then I want to give everyone a chance to sort of uh, make a closing statement if that's cool with everybody. Um, but you know when particularly when Charlotte mentioned the Palestinian man who was arrested and shackled in his hospital room, I, I, I thought immediately of Jacob Blake, who after being shot seven times was, was in his hospital bed, handcuffed to the bed. Um, and I was hoping that the speakers could address Israel's role in training the US police in tactics that are currently being used, um, both against Black Lives Matter protesters, but also the daily violence and humiliations and terror that is visited upon occupied portions of the US uh, as well. So that's open for anyone to, uh, to respond to. Well, everyone's being polite. Go ahead, Khaled. Uh, well, no, I was going to say maybe Suzanne could answer this or Charlotte, uh, but uh, uh, my only comment very quick is that, uh, yes, Israel uh, do a lot of dirty stuff in training security forces all over the world and not just police uh, in the United States. They are complicit and security coordination with the Philippines and the fascist regime of Dorothy. They are complicit and they, they had a, a very, you know, known record of what they used to do uh, in South Africa uh, uh, and, and elsewhere. But at the same time, we need to understand that this is a U.S. Uh, situation. So it's not just Israel because, you know, uh, is, Israel, the United States is the problem. Uh, also, uh, and the police in the United States is the problem, uh, and we should focus on that and not just uh, on what Israel does, I mean, including what Israel does. It's a very important point, Khaled, very important point. Thank you, comrade. Um, Susan or Charlotte, did you want to talk about specifically that, that connection as well? Charlotte, you go ahead. I've talked about, I mean, I can go up to you. Well, I'm just gonna just 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 gonna be really brief, which is, you know, a lot of organizations that have been talking about this issue have been campaigning around the concept of a deadly exchange, and I think that it's in, this concept of an exchange is actually what's important here because what we are at, what we're seeing is, you know, settler colonial projects, racist racist entities and states teaching from and learning from each other. And that kind of deadly exchange isn't just limited to the United States and Israel. So for example, if we look at, you know, if we're just talking about this uh, UAE agreement for collaboration with Israel. Well, in the past, the UAE has been involved in buying Israeli surveillance technologies to use against Emirati activists that want to, that, um, you know, stand up for labor rights or speak out against the the ruling uh, the ruling elite. So you know, there's there's constantly this uh, exchange of technologies, and that this isn't something you know that's just started. In fact, um, when for example uh, the U.S. was prohibited under its own laws from selling arms uh, to apartheid South Africa, we started to see Israel filling in that role, filling in that gap. We've also seen Israel fill in that gap in the past. In Latin America, when movements in the in the United States supporting Latin American people's struggles have been able to put restrictions on what the U.S. can do officially as far as its own military trades, we've seen Israel fill in the gap in supporting and arming um, the most violent and reactionary regimes around the world. And this is all part of that deadly exchange, which is targeting the Palestinian people, which is targeting. Um, black people and black movements, which is targeting um, African people as a whole. 
um, you know, when we're looking at the foundation and forming of AFRICOM in Africa and how that's being used by the United States to establish this kind of military control over Africa, that's not separate from the adventures in Israeli military um, placement that Caleb was speaking about earlier. This is a comprehensive exchange and alliance on the part of imperialism, on the part of the enemies of the people. And so fighting against the police forces in the United States is really not that separate from fighting against the Israeli occupation forces um, in Palestine. And so that's why it is so important, you know, just to echo what Susan and Caleb said earlier regarding um, the necessity of building that international alliance against imperialism, racism, colonialism, um, and all forms of oppression in order to fight for real and meaningful liberation. Thanks, Charlotte. Comrade? So um, Israel has, um, has had their hands in just about every, every war, every major human rights um, catastrophe in the world. And much of their, I mean, they, Israel has really stepped in. I mean, we, you know, we got a couple of examples like South Africa, for example, um, but anytime there is a rogue nation that is um, <clears throat> censored by the by the UN, Israel is the, is the country that steps in to arm them. Um, for example, um, Israel was involved in uh, South Sudan's civil war. Um, and by the way, I gave a whole lecture about this that um, was a keynote at the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs in 2019. You can find it online. Um, in the Bosnian massacres, um, Israel, Israel armed the Serbs. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, one of the generals who was um, on trial at The Hague, um, one of the pieces of evidence against Israel was his diary in which he talked about, you know, arms and training that they were getting from Israel. Um, Israel was also involved in Rwanda. Um, they armed, <laughs> they, they armed, um, uh, uh, I mean, they, they, they supplied the weapons um, that were used to, uh, to massacre Rwandans. Um, as a matter of fact, one of, uh, so there's, there's, uh, uh, there's two human, human rights lawyers, um, uh, Mac, uh, Ite Mac, and, and another guy, I can't remember his name now, but they, um, they have been uh, relentless in their pursuit of trying to uncover um, classified documents. So, and, and, uh, and where it comes to Rwanda, they um, found an Israeli arms guy who, who actually boasted of selling arms to Rwanda. And in his, and in his views, and these were his words, I'm actually a doctor. In that um, he was, you know, claiming that he did them a favor, that he made sure they died quickly with, you know, modern weaponry instead of um, machetes and whatnot. And then, of course, you know, um, uh, the they were literally the only friend um, that uh, apartheid South Africa had in the world when the whole world just could not, you know, no longer they could no longer be seen um, with with that horrible regime. And they boasted about the, their cooperation. Um, and as a matter of fact, Israel sold nuclear um, technology to South Africa. And this was unveiled in a book that was published, I think, in the early 90s. Um, and it was only, you know, they sort of self, um, they got rid of their, uh, they denuclearized, I guess, when, when it was very clear that the ANC was going to take over um, because they didn't want nuclear weapons in the hands of black people, basically. So they sort of self-disarmed. Um, uh, Israel has also been involved in um, the, the, the atrocities in Myanmar. They have, they have been supplying weapons um, that are being used against the Rohingyas. Um, Israel has been, they have been giving fascists in Ukraine support and logistics. I mean, these are professed Nazis. They are, you know, they're, they're friends with them and, and, and they're training and arming them. I mean, the, the you know, um, 
in Poland, Matusz Morawiecki, this, you know, uber fascist guy. I mean, Israel is, is I mean, they're chummy with him. They're chummy with, with all these fascist regimes um, because Israel itself is a fascist re regime. And, um, and that's, that is Israel's biggest export. It is not a startup nation. It is not technology. It is death machines. That is what Israel exports to the world. They export death. They export surveillance. They export the, the machinery of, uh, of oppression and totalitarianism. That, that is their contribution um, to the world. Thank you. And comrades, I have the unhappy task of noting that we have almost come to the end of this uh, webinar, but um, I want to sort of ask a question and, and have that be a sort of way for everyone to sort of make a closing comment. And this includes you too, Charlotte. Um, you know, when, w earlier when, when Khaled was talking about the normalization of relationships between some Arab countries and Israel, he made it clear that we're talking about the capitalist ruling class um, of these countries. And in, you know, in some cases, the, the fascist regimes like Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and Rodrigo Duterte. Um, the working class and the masses have no reason to support the normalization of of uh, relations with with Israel, and I wonder if you know we can talk about the propaganda campaign that's aimed not just at uh, the Arab working class, but also the working class globally, and and how we can combat that, and how we can build working class solidarity globally. Um, if that's if everyone can talk about that and solve that problem in two minutes. <laughs> so, um, Susie, why don't why don't we start with you? Oh. Ah, sorry. Uh you know, I mean, I feel like we could talk for hours just about that. Um, I think it's what we're doing now, right? I mean, I, I, I think we, we, have, we have all kinds of new tools at our disposal for organizing. Um, and it's, I think we, we have to continue to, to, um, to educate people and to organize and to have these webinars to talk about the parallels to talk about the interconnectedness of our struggles, the interconnectedness of um, of uh, uh, of like even struggles within the U.S. You know um, that are contained within one country. The interconnectedness of those of of prison abolition with anti-capitalism with climate change. All of these struggles um, finding a way to coalesce on common ground for um for social justice and uh and a gentler way of living um i mean i don't you know i don't i wish i had those answers i wish i had a crystal ball i wish i had you know a magic wand um to just bop people over the head and just make them see reason you know it is it's um it's it's frustrating at times but it's also hugely inspiring too because i mean if you look at um, you know, all of the, all of the shit that we, that we have had to endure from this administration over the past few years and even, and before him, the, the administration before him, there was plenty of, of, um, well-disguised horrors. Um, people are, um, are reacting in ways that are hugely inspiring. People are having courage. They are taking, I mean, there's, you know, here in Philly, I mean, there's, there's homeless encampments demanding housing. There's, um, you know, there, there's, there's black, the, the movement for black lives is relentless and it's unstoppable. And it takes, you know, it takes new forms and it pops up in different places with different um, intensities and different creative, um, uh, 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 creative ways of resisting. Um, and I do, I do think also that this new this new generation um, is is not like us in that um, I think there's there's they are far more um, united in their anti capitalism ideals than than people of my generation are and um, and I do I feel like that's that's a huge source of hope for me. Um, there's a, um, you know, sometimes I, I feel like they don't even have to preface what they're saying. There's a sort of understanding among young people, people my daughter's age, 
um, that, you know, there's this sort of uh, uh, default rejection of capitalism, default rejection of Zionism and white supremacy. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll let <laughs> Charlotte and, and, and Khaled talk, sorry, I'm rambling. No, go ahead, uh, Charlotte, if you wanna make a closing remark. Well, um, thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here with all of you today. I know there have been so many more questions also coming in from people and I'm so sorry that we're not even going to be able to get to answer half of them because there are so many excellent thoughts that people are sharing and so much more conversation to have. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing up and mentioning uh, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. Today is also an international day of solidarity against Duterte's tyranny in the Philippines. And this is also a regime that imprisons a number of political prisoners. And I will note that political prisoners in the Philippines have also very consistently shown solidarity and support for the political prisoners in Palestine. And there's a tremendous amount of solidarity that we see, you know, from those who are the most oppressed, from those who are you know, behind bars, whether that is black liberation prisoners um, in the United States, um, indigenous strugglers in, in this country, um, whether that's Palestinian prisoners, Irish Republican prisoners, Filipinos, um, a Turkish lawyer just um, who just went on hunger strike for over 200 days said, you know, our struggle, we see it as being like those of the Palestinian prisoners. And so it's, um, there really is this tremendous internationalism. And I do want to say here that just as we see, for example, Duterte is actually the first president of the Philippines to visit Israel, who actually has developed um, millions of dollars in new contracts with Israeli security facilities. So just like Susan was talking about, about Israel exporting death machines, we're also seeing that taking place in the Philippines and using that to sharpen the point of repression being directed against the people's movements in the Philippines and against the masses in the Philippines as well. Um, so that's another very clear example of what's going on. And I think that this event taking place today, even though it's about Palestine, is also a part of that conversation because it is such a global conversation um, finally, I want to say yes. This is a this is a class question. This is a uh, a local class question. And it is a global class question, and that means that every time there is a victory on a strike, every time there is a victory for the working class anywhere in the world, that is also a victory that weakens imperialism, and that means it is also a victory for the Palestinian people. And every time there is a victory for the Palestinian people, there is also a victory for oppressed peoples and the workers of the world. Um, 50 years ago, Hassan Kanafani said, the Palestinian cause is not for Palestinians only. It is the cause of every revolutionary. It is the cause of the oppressed and exploited masses in our era. And um, I think that that sentiment is just as true today um, and perhaps even more so than it was 50 years ago and can continue to inspire us to organize and mobilize and continue to struggle. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Khaled, would you like to uh, have the last word here? Uh, very quick. Uh, I think that uh, our message to the working class in particular and to the popular classes at large should be uh, clear that capitalism, and as long as capitalism, as long as the United States and imperialism are ruling our world, there will be miseries and there will be occupations and colonization and prisons and injustice all the world. Uh, as long as Israel exists, Palestinians will suffer. Palestinians will always suffer, uh, uh, you know, as long as Israel exists. And that there are an alternative world uh, in Palestine as well as globally, a world based on equality, justice, and uh, freedom. And these values uh, should be at the uh, core of our organizing. And when we look at popular movements today, particularly the left, have a responsibility in strengthening the relationship of building an international popular front uh, or globally. Uh, and to see where do we have common denominators and focus on that and our differences, we can always uh, talk about it and have a, a, an honest uh, uh, dialogue about where 
you know, uh, we come from. Uh, the Palestinian experience in fighting Israel have shown that states cannot fight uh, a, a state like Israel, but resistance movement could actually defeat Israel. Uh, in 2006, Israel was defeated in Lebanon uh, in a military war. And so we should not just wait for some strong country to become a, a leftist and uh, ruled by leftists, and so it becomes the center of the left. Popular movements could also be uh, an alternative, at least for the uh, current uh, times, because it is a stage of steadfastness and uh, uh, it is a stage of upholding the principles that uh, socialism is the alternative to capitalism and 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 uh, true people uh, choices uh, is is the alternative. And if we cannot today uh, defeat this system of oppression because of their strength and because of uh, their power, this is not a, a destiny forever uh, on humanity. Uh, if anything, history have taught us that things will change and uh, uh, we will be victorious uh, at, the, at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. It's such a perfect note to end on. And Charlotte Cates, Susan Abulhawa, Khaled Berkat, it's been an honor to be with all you tonight, comrades. Thank you so much. Um, and Thank definitely... You. Make sure you check out Sami Dun. Um, make sure that you check out Susan. Where can you tell people where they can purchase your book? Um, yeah, if you go to susanabulhawa.com, there's a link to Bookshop. So, great. As we know, comrades, everything under capitalism takes money. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, any amount that you can donate to uh, Workers World Party to help us bring down this rotten, racist, oppressive system. Um, here are ways that you can donate. You know, we keep doing these um, webinars. Um, I also want to let everyone know, speaking of new books, um, that we do have a new book available entitled What Road to Socialism. Um, it's a compilation of writings from Workers World newspaper, some of our comrades, um, about the many working class struggles happening today. Um, there's also a bunch of different books you can download for free from workers.org. Um, and you can visit the website to, to find those. And finally, um, I would just like to say that next week, um, Thursday, September 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, we're going to have our next webinar. Um, it is going to be hosted by the Prisoner Solidarity Committee of Workers World Party. And the subject is Women and Gender Oppressed Prisoners, Survival and Resistance. Um, it's going to be a great one. We're going to uh, be speaking with Janetta Johnson, the executive director of the Transgender Variant and Intersex Justice Project. We're going to have Janet and Janine Africa of the MOVE organization, um, and it's going to be um, co-chaired by my co-chair from the Prisoner Solidarity Committee, Miranda Christman of Houston, Texas. So I hope to see you all then. But once again, let me thank all my panelists. Thank you so much for being on. This was a wonderful discussion. Shukran Jazilan, thank you. Masalama and good night. Free Palestine and build a worker's world. Free Palestine, build a worker's world. Free Palestine. Bye.